All right, welcome to History 361, the history of Germany. This is week four. And what we want to do in this very short lecture for week four is really describe what was happening in Europe at the time period uh, from about 1618 to roughly about 1815. Uh, when Europe was really searching for a balance of power among the different kingdoms and uh, empires. And uh, this is very important in order to put things in perspective. Many of you I know are not uh, history majors. And so uh, I'm assuming by giving this lecture that we'll all be on an even playing field and you'll all, you know, understand what's going on around Germany and what was including Central Europe and what is Prussia and, and, of course, Germany as well. So up to now, we've been discussing the Habsburg family and the importance of the Habsburg family. And you know, uh, with the death of Charles V, that the Habsburgs divided up their lands, remember, to different branches of the family, the Austrian Habsburgs and then the Spanish Habsburgs who controlled Spain and the Spanish New World possessions in America, in North and South America. Well, a very important thing happens in 1713 with the Treaty of Utrecht ending the War of the Spanish Succession. And this war gets its start in best by just looking at this genealogical chart here. So Philip IV was the King of Spain and Spanish New World possessions. He ruled until 1665. His son Charles II was a Spanish Habsburg and ruled until 1700. You can see what happens here. Charles had no direct heirs. Charles did, however, have two sisters. One of them, Maria Theresa, married the very powerful king, the so-called Sun King of France, because he said he was like the sun and all of his subjects revolved around him. And that was Louis XIV uh, of the Bourbon dynasty of France. Now, Louis XIV and the Bourbon dynasty were, it was a very powerful Catholic uh, dynasty of uh, France. He had a son, and then in turn, he had a son. So this would have been Louis XIV's grandson, Philip of Anjou, who was of the Bourbon dynasty. Now, on the other end, Margarita Theresa married, who was the sister of Charles II, married Leopold I of Austria, and there's a grandson on that side as well. So either the Spanish Habsburg territories could have gone to an Austrian Habsburg or to the Bourbon dynasty. Both of them were, as you see, grandsons of uh, Philip IV. So these two uh, will fight one another, and of course this will be a, a war that involves others in European history as well. And um, many people were very concerned that if Louis XIV claimed the throne for his grandson, Philip of Anjou, then the rest of the European powers worried that the uniting of the houses of France and Spain would upset the balance of power in Europe. So actually a grand alliance formed against France. Uh, England, Holland, Austria, and Brandenburg, Prussia all became allies uh, against France. Uh, the Allies essentially became tired by the fighting, so it was ended by the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713. Now, by the terms of the, and this is a very important treaty in European and world history, by the terms, six major things happened. Number one, Philip of Anjou, Philip V, that is the grandson of Louis XIV, actually became the King of Spain. Now, remember, he was of the French Bourbon dynasty. So what happens after 1713 in the Treaty of Utrecht is the same family, the Bourbon dynasty, will rule both France and Spain, but not the same ruler. Although not the same ruler, it will be the same family. Now this will, this will mean that the Spanish, the Habsburgs lose. They will lose because Philip V retained Spain and the Spanish overseas empire. The Habsburgs would no longer have control over Spain and the Spanish overseas empire, that vast empire in North and South America. As kind of a consolation prize, Austria then received the Spanish Netherlands, Milan, with Spanish Netherlands, Belgium, um, Milan, what became Belgium, then Milan, 
which is in northern Italy, Naples, southern Italy, and Sardinia off the coast of Italy. Now, if you notice here, so the Habsburgs receive this, it's this, these, uh, these Spanish territories as kind of a consolation prize, but they've lost Spain and the Spanish overseas empire, which now went to the Bourbon dynasty. Another thing that will happen after this point in time is whenever there are wars that France is involved in, usually France um, will drag its um, same family, uh, the Bourbon family relatives of Spain, into the war. Um, and we're going to see that in, in a second here. Um, so England received the so-called Asiento, an agreement to last 30 years, whereby a British company received the right to import up to 4,800 slaves a year into the Spanish colonies and to sell their duty-free such merchandise as could be carried on a single 500-ton ship that was to accompany the annual Spanish treasure fleet from Europe. England also received some very important areas, including Gibraltar, which of course marks the, uh, the uh, gate, really, way, gateway into the Mediterranean Sea, Menorca, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia, and the shores of Hudson Bay, these all being, of course, uh, these latter three in North America. And for the history of Germany, it was very important that the Margrave of Brandenburg was recognized as being king of Prussia. So Prussia is now uh, a, a very important kingdom that has emerged by 17. 13, 14, 15. And this is what the map essentially shows. So as those consolation prizes, um, the Austrian Habsburgs got the Austrian Netherlands, which would become Belgium eventually, the Milan up here, Naples, and Sardinia. And uh, Great Britain, of course, would get, you know, Gibraltar down here, as well as Menorca here. Um, Spain, of course, went to the Bourbon family, family, so a different ruler, but the same dynasty, the Bourbon dynasty ruling both Spain and France, and then, of course, all of the Spanish New World possessions. And then you've got up here, Brandenburg, Prussia. Now, another war that we need to look at, because it involved, of course, the Habsburgs, was the War of the Austrian Succession. And essentially what happened there was Emperor Charles VI of the Habsburg dynasty, of the Austrian Habsburg dynasty, died in 1714, okay? And uh, Maria Theresa, his daughter, was to succeed him. And meanwhile, in 1714, in Prussia, Frederick II, or Frederick the Great, as he's called in history, came to the throne. And, and he really thought that he could kind of kick around Maria Theresa since she was a woman and an, em and, and an empress. So in 1714, Frederick the Great invaded the Austrian province of Silesia along the Oder River. It was a very wealthy area with 1.2 million people. It had factories and mines. Um, this war was ended by the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle in 1748, in which, and this is very important, Prussia kept the territory of Silesia. Now, what did that mean? Well, in truth, Frederick's acquisition of Silesia has been called, at least by one historian, uh, Dorn, the, quote, the greatest permanent conquest of territory hitherto made by any power in the history of modern Western Europe, end quote. So, through the War of the Austrian Succession, Frederick the Great of Prussia again asserts himself, and Prussia is on the rise. The next war that is uh, that occurs is a world war. It's called the Seven Years' War from 1756 to 17. Uh, 63. In essence, Britain and France, who, you know, were perennial enemies, had been as early as 1754 at war with one another over their colonies in North America. In American history, we call that the French and Indian War. Well, the French and Indian War was assumed into, consumed by what really is called the Seven Years' War. The very the importance of this is that the end of the war, Britain gained Canada, Florida, and all of the land east of the Mississippi River except New Orleans. France was left with no territory in North America as it ceded 
Louisiana, it gave Louisiana to Spain in compensation for dragging Spain into the war. So had it not been the for the Seven Years' War, you know, many of us here in northern Kentucky, Cincinnati might be uh, speaking French and eating lots of wonderful uh, French bread and so forth. So um, this is really, the Seven Years' War is one of the turning points in history where Britain's empire is uh, vastly enhanced and uh, Britain received as well most of India except for two places, Pondicherry and Chandanagar in, in India. So Britain was becoming a really a world power and you, you can obviously see that France uh, was losing out and of course Spain was on the decline as well. Now the last thing that we need to look at is um, the is Napoleon and the Napoleonic Wars. Um, you know, in the 1790s, um, uh, there was a uh, revolution in France, and they overthrew the monarchy, and it went through a number of different stages where it was kind of very radical, and then it became kind of very... Um, conservative and by the time of the 17 late 1790s 1799 uh, Napoleon came to power he had been a general in the French Revolutionary Army and he became he called himself first consul of France now in 1804 he declared himself Emperor of France a year before that in fact in 1803 Napoleon had gone to war with Britain, and um, now he really, in 1804, embarked on his conquest of Europe. And you may ask why, and the essential reason why here, just to make something uh, more simple than, of course, it is, is that um, the rest of the powers in Europe were vastly afraid of France, of revolutionary France, and of Napoleon. So, uh, Napoleon is one of those characters in history who historians have studied and many books have been written about and many people are still confused as to what he hoped to achieve. So we're not going to go into that since this is not a, um, a history of, of France. But one thing that we can say is that by 1806, Napoleon controlled uh, most, uh, much of Germany, and the Holy Roman Empire officially came to an end. Instead, Napoleon established the uh, German Confederation of the Rhine. Now, in 1812, Napoleon decided to invade Russia, which was really his worst mistake. It was the beginning of the end for Napoleon. He was defeated in 1813 at the Battle of Leipzig. He abdicated. He went into exile on the island of Elba. But then he escaped from Elba and returned to France on March 1st of 1815. The Allies attacked and defeated him at Waterloo in Belgium on June 18th, 1815. He again abdicated and was sent into exile on St. Uh, Helena, small Atlantic island. And that was the end of... Um, of, of course, uh, Napoleon, he, he would die on the island of St. Helena. But his significance was that he erased, he and his troops moved into Germany and erased the Holy Roman Empire in 1806. So uh, he established instead the German Confederation of the Rhine. Now, what happened after the, um, uh, the Napoleonic Wars is a great Congress uh, met uh, to um, yield a, fee, a peace treaty, to sign a peace treaty at Vienna, called the Congress of Vienna. It, it achieved a balance of power, which for most intents and purposes, not all intents and purposes, led to, from 1815 to about 1914 in the beginning of World War I, a relative century of peace, relatively speaking. 
Okay, and uh, there there were wars, and we're going to discuss some of those wars: the Austro-Prussian War, the Franco-Prussian War, etc. But not these giant world wars uh, and these uh, these these great wars of previous times. By the Congress of Vienna, the Bourbon dynasty was restored to France in a constitutional monarchy. France was given the boundaries it had in 1792 and was not required to pay any reparations. The map of Europe was redrawn. Britain gained some bases it had won in the war, for instance, Cape Town in South Africa, Malta in the Mediterranean Sea, Prussia. Prussia gained territory in the Rhineland and Saxony. Austria gave the Austrian Netherlands to the Netherlands, but gained some territory in Poland, northern Italy, and the eastern coast of the Adriatic Sea. The new German Confederation, a loose confederation, would include 39 nations, including Austria, Prussia, and smaller alliances. And at the end of all of this, the Quadruple Alliance members would agree to meet occasionally to avoid future catastrophes like the Napoleonic Wars. So again, the importance here is some exchange of territory where Prussia gains territory in the Rhineland and Saxon. Uh, Austria gained some territory as well, but gave up the Austrian Netherlands to the Netherlands. Um, and that ends up making the um, uh, map of Europe look quite differently. And look what has grown. Prussia is continuing to grow in northern uh, Germany here, and that is going to be immensely significant. Any questions, please feel free to email or phone me. I'm always happy to help and have a